difference. And the important thing is that we, that we distinguish domestication from taming. Okay, I can take a, uh, a raccoon kit at, you know, soon after birth and I can tame that thing. I can bring it up so that it will be tamed until it reaches an age of maturity and then it's going to turn on itself, right? Or it's going to turn on me. It's not going to turn on itself, it's going to turn on me. And even if I were to keep it tame, once it reproduced, even if I took two of them, tamed them, had them reproduce, their offspring are going to be just as wild as any other wild raccoon. So taming and domestication are two different things, which is why I don't get very excited when somebody calls me up and says, hey, I have a pet raccoon. I don't you know, I had to put this in there. You've got to get the Flintstone if you're talking about that and whole thing. So here's the, you were talking about the domestication of the dog. Who, where, when, and why, and these are two, our two charges, two of our three charges. That's uh, on, the, on our right there is Annabelle Lee. Uh, we rescued her out of a, uh, out of a uh, quarry several years ago. And then every, you know, you can't get by without an emergency backup dog, and that's Beans there on the left, our small auxiliary dog. <laughs> So when we talk about domestication, the first thing that the first thing that scientists want to talk about when you when you're talking about the origin of a species and where they came from is archaeological evidence. So these guys, you know, these these anthropologists, they want to pour over the little bits of a bone, and from a little bone fragment, they can extrapolate this whole huge skeleton, and even talk about the the form and function of the organism, and even as far as I know, you know what they have on their iPod. And so we look back at the uh, at, at canine uh, bone fragments, and you know what? The evidence there isn't all that good. There, there's not a huge amount of it that exists. We're talking about some, some of the early caves in Europe where some skeletal remains have been found, where what appears to be a dog skull was that dates back about 30,000 years. Now, you will find that these experts will argue quite a bit back and forth, is it a dog or is it a wolf? You know, eh, which is it? And there's going to be a lot of arguments back and forth. The fact of the matter is that there's not much really good archaeological evidence be before about 12 to 14,000 years ago. That's when these bones tend to date back to, is 12 to 14,000 years ago. And one pretty exciting find was a skeleton found by Francois Valla in 1977 when he unearthed a grave in, the, in, in what's called the Tufian uh, sighting at the site. The Tufian region is the eastern Mediterranean, and this is where um, civilization, where sedentary civilization is thought to begin. This is where people find this stuff wandering around and decided, you know what, we're going to stay here. Okay? And so a grave on Earth from, the, from about 14,000 years ago was of a woman. There was a woman, and she is clutching here. This is the best picture I could find on the internet. She's clutching. Here, which you, this little blob that you can't distinguish anything on this slide, is a puppy. It's a, it's a five-month-old puppy. Uh, again, the experts argue about whether it's a wolf or a dog, but it's obvious that she took this puppy into the afterlife with her not to eat the thing or anything like that. It wasn't a utilitarian purpose. But as I look at that picture, and as, as the experts look at it, they agree that you know she had some kind of a relationship with this puppy. A, a loving relationship. And that goes back about 14,000 years. Now, I promised myself, and I need you to just wave me off, we have to talk about, when we're, when we're talking about aging back, when we're talking about the origin of dogs and where they came from, we have to talk about DNA analysis, okay? And I promised myself I'm not going to go off on a tangent on how, this, on how this all works, because if I get too far down, I very quickly get to the level of my own understanding about it, but essentially, when we're looking at the origin of a species, we have to look at, one of the things that's very useful to look at is the genetic material in that species. So, you know, we all have our cells that are filled with, <coughs> with, 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 each of our body has jillions of cells, and in those cells, in each cell is a nucleus, and in the nucleus is genetic material. And genetic material is like the handbook for our bodies. It's what, it's what our bodies look at when we decide how we're going to put ourselves together in this, you know, again, this mystical uh, process of regenerating ourselves and building the body in the first place. 
So in the nucleus of the cell, and this is the nucleus, you have genetic material, but also out in the cytoplasm, there is genetic material and little organs and little organelles that are in that cytoplasm. And these organelles are called mitochondria. And mitochondria are like the little engines of the cells. They, they make the, the energy that, that the cells utilize to carry on other processes. And the neat thing about mitochondria is that they have their own DNA, probably because way, way, way back when, in evolutionary time, mitochondria were gobbled up by bigger cells, and instead of digested, they were utilized as the, as the engines of the cells. So they are, in essence, we all have jillions of little other organisms living in our bodies. And so when we look at the DNA of mitochondria, they, they have their own specific DNA. And the neat thing about mitochondria DNA is that it all comes from mom. That doesn't contribute any. So when we look at mitochondria DNA and we look at the variations in that DNA, we can say that all came from mom. And that just simplifies the process for researchers so they can actually, by looking at the variations of DNA, they can tell something about how old a species is. And when you look at a certain spot geographically and look at, compare the DNA to uh, habitat, habitants of that geographical locale as opposed to somebody else, or someplace else on Earth, they can make some certain surmisals about, the, about where, how, how long those species have been there and how closely related they are to each other. Does that make sense? Because that's as far as I want to go to with the DNA. But when they look at mitochondrial DNA, and this was done with humans, and, and found by mitochondrial DNA that humans, you know, left Central Africa and crossed out across the world, and they trace back to a, to a single, what is called a mitochondrial gene, or a single woman who gave, who gave rise to the, to the human population. Um, and when that's done with dogs, and I keep turning it off, okay, when it's done with dogs, a couple things came out of the studies. One was that dogs evolved from the gray wolf, uh, Canis lupus, between 14,000 and 155,000 years ago. Now that's not very precise. Uh, it might have occurred just once, or it might have occurred many times. There may be one founding event, or there may be many. And the site of the origin is in East Asia. And this is kind of surprising because not much started there. You know, everything started out in north of Africa and, and, and that region there. So, you know, this is kind of surprising from mitochondrial DNA studies. And then one other little fact, and, and this holds up pretty well, that is that all the dogs on our side of the world, New World dogs, they all came over, they, they first came over on the Bering Land Bridge. They didn't arise separately from Old World dogs. And by the way, all those dogs are gone and have been replaced by dogs that, that, that subsequently came over for, with Europeans, you know, like who are called post columbian 1492 off the sail of the ocean blue. So all those dogs came over afterwards, and we have no more of the dogs that came over on the uh, on the Bering Land Bridge. Well, in 2010, just last year, uh, Bridget von Holt there on the left, and Robert Wayne, working out of Robert Wayne's lab at UCLA, and with a number of other researchers, they looked at nuclear DNA. And they were able to use the technology that has advanced in the decades since those first studies were done. And they were able to study over 900 dogs, 85 breeds, and 200 wolves from around the world, looking at the nuclear DNA, assessing 48,000 genetic markers. Now, this is just the power of computing um, uh, being utilized. And they found a few things. One is the site of the greatest genetic variability, and therefore the likely site of origin really is in the Middle East. Really is in the Middle East, that eastern Mediterranean area where people first settled. That's where the most genetic variability occurs. There is genetic variability in East Asia, and they conclude that that's probably because dogs backbred with wolves in, in that region. Okay. And I, I talked to Robert Wayne on the phone last week, and I have to thank him very much for sending me this. And I'll, I'll give you all a few minutes just to write that, just to get a copy of that written down, OK? Um, and I, I haven't even looked at this. He sent me this paper, and uh, it's, it looks like a pretty neat, colorful graph about all the origin of all the dog breeds. And I'll give it more time, but we don't have time to talk about that here today. Now, any of you who have looked into this all know about Ray Coppinger, right? OK. I mean, and this guy has done more for canine research than maybe anybody. 